Here to talk about the changing face of hospitals, please welcome Dr. Elizabeth Nabel, the President and CEO of Brigham Health, here with The Atlantic's Steve Clemens. Greetings all. Wow, there's light. Uh, Betsy, thanks for joining us today. And, sure. um, you know, I, was, I, I always sort of feel worried when I get one of these everything's great, feel good interviews. Someone said about you, all I can say is that her entire life she's been known as someone who really is really compulsive about doing a good job. Uh, and, and, you know, it just sets everything My mother cynical would be proud, and dark right? about me on edge. <laughs> so you run... Uh, major health healthcare system, a health uh, yeah. hospital. Yeah. Hospitals are under siege from a lot of forces. Yeah. Yeah. And and our friends at Stat, they had a wonderful headline here uh, covering you. Says not even the mattress pads were spared. An inside look at a top hospital struggle to cut costs. Yeah. So I'm interested in all the innovation you're doing, but I'm also interested in what the real state of hospitals are today, yeah. as seen through your lens. Yeah, hospitals are, are evolving. I should say healthcare is evolving. You you all know that. There are a number of trends uh, that are afoot. Uh, first and foremost, we're moving care as much as we can to the community and to the home, and I hope we'll talk about that uh, in a bit. Second, as you know, all of us as patients and consumers are becoming more responsible for our own health care. We're engaging more in, in health care decisions, uh, and we're focusing much more on prevention uh, and wellness. Um, third, we have great technology that's a, a platform that underlies a lot of this evolution. And then fourth, the frank reality is that there is just no more money coming into healthcare and that we have to do more uh, with less. Uh, and you can either focus on just the, the cost cutting and, and make it boring and difficult, or you can focus on the innovation and discovering to really feed into the cost cutting to do it in a smart way. So let's pretend I had pneumonia yeah. and, and it's, it's uh, this weekend and I'm showing up at your place. Yeah. What do I experience? Okay. So you have, you have pneumonia and uh, rather than calling your primary care office, which you probably should do, uh, they might send you to uh, our urgent care. You come to our urgent care. Uh, and we determine you have an acquired, a community-acquired pneumonia uh, for which we want to treat you with antibiotics. We think it's bacterial in nature. I um, do too, by the way. Good. Okay. Yeah. You, you, you look to be yeah. in, in good health, and I would say, do you have someone at home with you who can help take care of you? You would say, yes, I've got a good support system. We say, perfect. Would you like to be admitted to your home? I, and and, I, and I, I never challenge a doctor, so I say, of course, you know, but, but what does that entail? Okay. And what do I have to pay you? What, what, what that means... And what don't I get if I... I mean, what am I losing? Okay, let me finish the yeah. story. So we're going to admit you to your house. And Dr. David Levine, who is our uh, general internist who runs our home hospital program, for which we have a daily census of five individuals, we're growing, will come to your home every morning about 8 a.m. and do house calls. How many of you remember Marcus Welby? Okay. How many of you remember Little House on the Prairie? Yeah, exactly. Uh. But no, serious, we'll come and do, do uh, rounds in the morning. A nurse will come with, do, do vitals. Information will be entered into your electronic medical record. You'll be given your instructions for the day. And you will be cared for it at home. A nurse will come every eight hours. Um, and you will be treated. Uh, you'll have a, a pick line put in, so you'll get your antibiotics. David uh, published a study, and he found that patient satisfaction was improved, the hospital stay, so to speak, was diminished, and the cost of care was lowering. Because you're not so saying... How, how does, I don't mean to interrupt, but how does Dr. David Levine... If, I have a doctor, Ashesh Patel, who's a pretty good guy, but we have an yeah. understanding that the least I see him and he sees me, the better or the less. Yeah. And, and uh, he's but so backed you, up. So how does yeah. a doctor okay. escape the grind that they have every day, the number of patients to meet me. And how does that become more efficient and cheaper? Yeah. Because Dr. Levine's job is to run the home hospital. He, he is a mm. hospitalist for people who are being cared for at home. He's paid to, to do this. Wow. And I would say the other about your relationship with your primary care doc. We, we are moving so we want half of every primary care encounter to be telehealth. Mm. So either online, blogging, or a, a, a visit uh, by, by video. Um, much of, of primary care can absolutely be done in, in so this way. So let me ask you a question. If you had unlimited resources and funds, would you be yeah. doing this? In other words, 
if, if by evolving and cutting costs and yeah. finding these ways, yeah. would you now, knowing what you know, choose to do what you're doing with, with, yeah. with uh, the direction that you're going yeah. anyway? Yeah. Or would you rather be enjoy thicker cushions, pads in your hospital no, beds? No, no. I, I, I think absolutely this is the way to go. I think at the end of the day, it's better care for patients. Because I, I think it, it has sparked a very serious uh, conversation between, uh, no, I say patients, I'm including myself, patients and our physicians around our own health care. So it's a, it's a dialogue. We take responsibility. Um, we, we, we own our data in our electronic medical record. We own our care. We own our management. Right. And uh, I just think this is a way to incentivize. You know, the, the other stark reality is this is where healthcare financing is going. Right. So we are clearly moving, and in Massachusetts we have moved from fee-for-service to value-based healthcare, where outcomes divided by cost equals the value you derive from your healthcare. So we are entirely focused on driving superior outcomes at the lowest cost. Do all of the major insurers agree to uh, pay for the cost of the home provided system that you've innovated? Because I know that that is one of the fuzzy parts of the, of the, of the insurance world that yeah. isn't solved for everyone doing what you're doing. You're right. So not, not all insurance companies are there yet. We decided as a hospital system we would underwrite hmm. the cost of doing the care because we thought it was the right thing to do for patients. Um, we've just uh, worked out payments uh, fees with two of the three larger commercial payers here in Massachusetts. Um, obviously, the, the payments are less than being in the hospital, so the payer, payer wins as well. Fascinating. Now, I also know that you are working in, as part of Harvard and whatnot, part of this um, new colloquium on taking your data, looking at radiology and applying mm -hmm. um, artificial mm -hmm. intelligence, completely mm -hmm. very different part of your innovation yeah. sphere. Yeah. But what are you doing on the AI front? Yeah. So uh, we have set up a center for clinical data sciences. When I say we, I mean partners healthcare. Uh, so this is a center with the Mass General and the Brigham. Uh, and we've entered into a large agreement uh, with uh, General Electric, mm -hmm. uh, where we're working with their engineers, their scientists, their AI experts, expertise, uh, and we're really thinking about how we can transform care. So we've decided right. to focus first on radiology uh, and pathology. So when you think about it, uh, think of the, the digital bits of information that comes off of every image that's taken, whether it's a right. chest ray, MR, CT. If you can aggregate all of that data and use informed learning to develop algorithms to do the initial reads, it makes a lot of sense, and if you can combine all of your images from across your health system to do it, think, think of the number of uh, data points. Mm. Um, so our radiologists and, and AI experts are developing algorithms. We anticipate we will get to the point where our images will be, be read by an AI algorithm first and then be sent back to the, the, the radiologist for a verification. You know, in many ways, it, it mimics what we've been doing in cardiology for many years. I, I'm a cardiologist, and, you know, for the past 30 years, you have your EKG done. Um, it's, it's done, uh, you know, by a machine electronically. It has algorithms for reading it. Mm. You get a printout with those algorithms, and then the cardiologist overreads. So just apply that concept uh, to radiology. And what's really cool is that within a health system, if you're being cared for in a very rural hospital, you're in a car accident in a rural hospital, and you don't have a radiologist on staff, your images can be fed into a central server location, be read and be overread by an expert uh, in, in a central area, and then the, the reading go back out to the docs taking care of you in that more rural area. Think, think about how you can achieve a higher standard of, of care. This rate. all sounds great. You know, this morning, uh, Jonathan Bush, the CEO of Athena Health, had a discussion with me, and he said one of the things that, was, that, that we didn't have that, that was, was a problem in healthcare is that there's no demand curve, that, it's, that you have this kind of blocky healthcare system that d does not rise and fall based upon need, based upon demand, based upon innovation. And I'm interested in whether, because as I'm listening to you, I wish the two of you were together, I'm just wondering whether you're beginning to find the inflection points where you can make it a more nimble yeah. and flexible system yeah. and, and, and whether you're fooling me about that or whether this is true. Um, so which is it? 
What would be my motivation to fool you? <laughs> no, but I mean, in other words, I mean, but as you look at those, I mean, I was reading about the costs that you're saving. So $50 million yeah. last year, nearly yeah. $50 million yeah. you've cut this year. Yeah. You're going to have this. So yeah. you're creating a market sensitive yeah. uh, evolution. Yeah. And, you're, and I'm just asking about the guts of the business, essentially, yeah. Yeah. and how you provide health care. Are you moving from something where you're, 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 to respond to Jonathan Bush, you are, in fact, creating a much more nimble yeah. Uh, system yeah, than we used yeah. to have. Yeah, a absolutely. And I think that's why you're seeing the consolidation go on in the health care mm. market, because size allows you to scale. And scale is, is a way that you can improve care right. and at a lower cost. Um, quite frankly, you know, take the analogy, you're in a car accident in a rural hospital. Rather than fully staffing an emergency room for, you know, a one you know, one event out of the month, that a horrible car accident, right. you know, you can staff that and have, have services done more centrally with mm. information going back out. The, the, the biggest cost of health care is labor mm. and staffing. And if you can provide care using some of these innovative approaches, using various technology platforms where you don't have to staff up every facility, you can deliver care mm. at a much lower cost. You know, one of the other things that intrigues me, because there's so many great people in the, in the healthcare field here that are looking at this, and I've learned it from education really, that, that when you find an innovation, you have to figure out how do you afford it across your system, how do you replicate it across different systems, mm. and how do you scale it? Yeah. And so that affordability, scalability, and replicability. Yeah. So what influence is what you're doing and, and, and evolving and playing with having yeah. on your sibling hospitals yeah. within the Harvard system, yeah. and yeah. Is, is the country, uh, besides the wonderful stat coverage that you've had, yeah. paying attention? Yeah. So, uh, you know, this is where we, we say, you know, science and medicine move forward by consensus. Mm -hmm. That Dr. David Levine is an academic uh, <laughs> physician. Um, he uh, designed this pilot around a home hospital, did a randomized controlled study, published the results, and now we're starting to scale. And he's getting requests from around the country to help uh, other hospital systems build a home hospital that they can scale as well. I mean, that's science and medicine moving forward by consensus. One thing I want to just uh, bring us to that, that you also touch in, in your leadership in the hospital is that you're the first woman to lead a Harvard uh, affiliated hospital, mm -hmm. which I don't know why that's the case. You might have some insights into that. And, and also just the interest the thing I was reading about, about Brigham uh, and as one of the question of ethnic diversity, both in patients and in yeah. caregivers, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just interested because I know, I mean, you know my boss and chairman, you lived, yeah. I, yeah. I know a lot about your background, yeah. but I mean, these are things that sort of sit as oddities out there. Yeah. What can we do yeah. in terms of gender and race and inclusion yeah. in that health environment yeah. that we're not doing today yeah. that's just yeah. a missing piece of the conversation? Boy, is, that is a really, really great question, and I wish we had a, a, the, the magic answer to that. I, I think we just all have to move forward, push forward in every way we can. Uh, I had the pleasure of training at Brigham Women's back in the 1980s. Um, I've always been very fond of the hospital. It, it's a terrific academic medical center that put a lot of emphasis on innovation and discovery. Mm -hmm. And so that's what really drew me back. But you're right. We live in the middle of Mission Hill, Roxbury, Dorchester part of, of, of Boston. It would be like southeast right. uh, D.C. Um, and so we serve a very diverse community. We have to have a diverse workforce. And that's incredibly important to me. Um, the other is that our students and our trainees uh, want to come and train in a, in a setting that's diverse, that's inclusive. That's the standard now. And we take great pride in, in educating the next generation of medical leaders. So I, I take it as my own personal obligation and responsibility to train the next generation of a diverse, inclusive workforce. Do you feel leaders. alone in that, in the world you're in, or do you feel no, like you've got a lot no. of support? I, from... I think, well, first of all, my, my board is completely aligned uh, with this vision. I, and I think uh, the physician leadership and partners is completely aligned with this as well. And I guess just as, I, as we wrap up, I am um, also kind of broadly interested in this question of your friendship with my, our, my owner. I'm going to out her. She used to live on the uh, street where David Bradley, who founded the corporate executive board, the advisory board, very healthcare industry focused. Mm -hmm. And the way he started this company was um, 
trying to drill down into what the up at night issues were mm -hmm. uh, for folks in the healthcare industry and business mm -hmm. and to kind of zero in on those. And so mm -hmm. if, if, if David Bradley were here and he were to call you and say, what are your biggest up at night issues right now that you are, that are raging around in your mind at night? What are yeah. those? Yeah. And, and leave us with a kind yeah. of yeah. You know, fear of the future. Yeah, so how are we gonna continue to care for the underserved in mm. our country? Uh, and um, how are we gonna continue to to openly accept immigrants uh, in the healthcare profession, which has always moved healthcare forward. In Massachusetts, all of our Medicaid patients now are in an accountable care organization. I think we're one of the, the few states in the country to, to require this. I'm incredibly excited about this, because this is, I think, a, a way that we're gonna be able to level the playing field uh, for, for all members of, of our society. Thank you so much for that. Betsy Nabel, yeah. President and CEO of Brigham Health, thank you so much. Christine.